So continuing in our lesson dealing with the path that God has for his people to walk, which has been ordained from eternity, <clears throat> the first principle that we're going to cover, Scripture indicates those in Christ are instructed to prepare for life in eternity, not life on earth. So in the Colossians, the third chapter, verse 1 to 3. Colossians 3, verses 1 to 3. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. So what he's saying here is that the saint is given the ability to prepare himself for life in a totally different reality. Life in eternity is not a continuation of life as we know it here on earth. And if a person is not prepared in this life when he enters into eternity, he's not going to be able to be prepared there either. Scripture teaches the saint's destiny lies in the heavens. What are the heavens? The heavens are an assembly of vast, elevated regions brought into existence by God for habitations. The heavens are tremendous regions that the scripture tells us about that exist they are habitations and they have other uses. And the scripture gives us understanding in different places about the heavens, God's purpose, and man's destiny in them. Turn to Isaiah 40, verse 22. Isaiah 40, verse 22. It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof, thereof are as grasshoppers, that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain, and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. So their main purpose is habitation, dwelling place. The Bible also goes on to give us an understanding of other things. Turn to Psalms. 104, verse 2. So Colossians is telling us that we should avail ourselves of understanding what our destiny is, and our destiny lies in the heavens. But if we remain ignorant in this life, when we enter into eternity, we're going to miss what God's called us to. Psalms 104, verse 2. Who covers thyself with light as with a garment, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain. So we see different scriptures are telling us the same thing. These are vast island universes that are in a state of elevation and they are stretched out. In other words, the capacity is enormous. Scripture teaches that they are also connected. Turn to Isaiah 48, verse 13.
If I get it, it's Isaiah 48, rather than Psalms 48. Isaiah 48, verse 13. Mine hand also hath laid the foundation of the earth, and my right hand hath spanned the heavens. When I call unto them, they stand up together. So they operate in unity, unity at God's command. They are numbered and they are named. Always taken to the third heaven. Scripture tells us God cannot be contained in the heavens or the heavens of heavens. They have numbers, they have names. Or the regions of heaven have numbers and names. Uh, what does the meaning of standing together? Arise. Are we talking about the inhabitants thereof or the regions? They're in a state of, they're stretched out, they're in a state of connectivity, and they can stand up or they can lie down. Why would they need to stand up or lay down? God designed them that way. Just for fun. Region, stand up? Everybody's looking. Again, you can't <laughs> see this from a human perspective. There are vast regions in eternity. But why would they need to stand up? Well, it has to do with the conditions that exist in life in these mass regions. Again, we are focusing from an earth-centered perspective, and it's difficult to comprehend. I know, I understand <laughs> where you're coming from. There's no limitation uh, in life in heaven. We, we have here, we live in a realm in which we experience tremendous limitation. You get from point A, you have to go through point B to point C. In heaven, you want to go from point A to point C, you're there. There is no transit or distance as we know it. Again, this is why the scripture is telling us to, to appropriate the word so that we can get again a comprehension of things beyond the earth. And set your affection on things above not on things on the earth. And what will happen is God will begin to change the way we conceive and perceive of things. You develop an eternal perspective. But we've got to put the time in to do it. Scripture teaches at death, the saint ascends to the place prepared for him. So at death, you're going to ascend to one of these regions. Turn to 2 Corinthians, 5th chapter, verse 1. What the scripture is telling us, since God chose us from eternity, he designated the place where we would reside when we leave this world. He designated what would await us because as a father, he gives us an inheritance. You inherit these heavens. And depending upon the life you live here on earth, the activities that you will participate in will be determined. St. Corinthians 5th chapter, verse 1. For we know, so Paul is saying, this is, this is a certainty, that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. There's a place there waiting for you. There's also provision waiting for you. This body that we have here, Paul is talking about, you leave it here. It's designed, crafted for life on earth in a totally different environment. Life in heaven is designed and patterned after the element of light. So you're going to have a celestial body that is built, designed 
for life in heaven in the realms of life. Turn to first turn to first Corinthians the fifteenth chapter. Verse thirty five to forty. Paul talks about bodies. 1 Corinthians 15, 35 to 40. But some man will say, How are the dead raised up, and with what body do they come? In other words, how do they manifest themselves in the resurrection? Verse 36. Now, fool. That which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain. It may chance of wheat or of some other grain. In other words, what Paul is saying is that the body that you die in is not the body that you resurrect in. Then he goes on. But God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him, and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, <coughs> another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, but the glory of the celestial is one and the glory of the terrestrial is another. What he's saying here is in the environment, God gives it a body commensurate with the environment in which it operates. Birds have a certain body. Horses have a certain body. People have a certain body. It's given to them to function in the condition in which they operate. So it is true for the bodies in heaven. You have a celestial body waiting for you that will enable you to access life in the celestial realm. It's part of your inheritance. Now, a person that's <coughs> born again has none of that. <coughs> Only being born into the family of God gives you the inheritance of God. So a person who does not experience the born again process cannot go to heaven. Turn to 1 Peter, 1st chapter. Verses 3 to 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And notice the word begotten. It means we've been born into the family of God through the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. That's what accomplished it. That's what established it. Two, an inheritance, incorruptible and undefiled, and that faith is not a way reserved in heaven for you. And the actual in the Greek is reserved in the heavens for you. So everything is there. It's waiting for you. It's your inheritance in Christ. Now, Scripture teaches the saints' treasures are also stored there. In other words, the things that you accumulate here in life that will enable you to access the fullness of life in the heavens also is waiting for you. The things that you have brought forth in your obedience to Christ <coughs> are taken and stored for you in the heavens. Turn to Matthew 6, chapter, verses 19 to 21. The 
himself, <coughs> like earning a crown. The crown is a reward. Your treasures are the things that you accrue by your good works. Uh, treasure. Mm -hmm. A treasure is wealth. It means something that will enable you to enjoy life in a greater degree than you ordinarily would. Here on earth, if you have a, a heavy bank account, $50,000, you can enjoy living in a society greater than somebody who's homeless, doesn't have any money. Here wealth is expressed in terms of money, dollars, gold, jewels, whatever. In heaven, wealth is centered off of what's called your good works here on earth. The works that you do for Christ will enable you to enjoy life more fully in the realms of light when you enter into heaven. Now, Matthew, the sixth chapter, Verse 19 to 21. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So it's talking about a life lived in producing fruit for the kingdom of God, a life lived in producing treasure here on earth means that when you get to your estate in heaven, you will be able to enjoy life to the fullest because of the things that you have accrued here on earth. Now, Scripture teaches that your estate in the heavens is <clears throat> being overseen by angels. Turn to Hebrews, the first chapter. Which of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? So they are ministering your inheritance. They are overseeing your inheritance in the heavens until you get there. Angels. Mm -hmm. Who angels are. Mm -hmm. Angels are overseeing the treasures. Overseeing your estate. Yeah, in the heavens. God assigns them that duty to maintain what's waiting for you. Now, Scripture teaches those who qualify for the rapture will be gathered out of their place in the heavens to return with the Lord. In other words, if you die before the rapture, you go to your place in these vast regions, and you go to your estate, and you take up your duties until the time that the Lord is going to return to glorify his saints. When that happens, the Lord descends from the presence of the Father down through these stratified heavens and calls you out to be with him and you descend with him to the earth to pick up your glorified body. Not to confuse the glorified body with the celestial body. The celestial body enables you to experience life in the region in which you go when you die. 
The glorified body enables you to experience life anywhere in the Father's creation. Turn to 1 Thessalonians, 4th chapter, verses 13 to 17. Thessalonians, fourth chapter, verses 13 to 17. But I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, in other words, the dead who have gone, who have died in Christ, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So the dead that are in these heavens, that are qualified to be glorified with Christ, he's going to bring back to earth and enable them to go over the place where the body is, and the body will come out of the ground in a glorified state and un be unified with the soul and the spirit and there will be one glorified unity, and then they will go into the presence of the Father. <clears throat> but this I say unto you, that by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or precede them which are asleep. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. <clears> then <throat> we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So all the generations that have died in Christ before the rapture will come back with him to get their glorified bodies, and those that are alive won't die, they'll be changed instantaneously into a glorified state. And the two groups become one, and they are taken into the presence of the Father. Now, Scripture teaches those saints who are in the heavens and did not qualify to make the rapture but have rewards coming will be taken from their place in the heavens at the second Coming. There will be others in the heavens who did not qualify for the rapture, but they led righteous lives. They have rewards coming. So at the end of the tribulation period, when the Lord returns to set up his kingdom, they're going to be gathered back from their place in the heavens back to earth to receive their rewards. Turn to Matthew, the 24th chapter, verse 30 to 31. <coughs> Matthew 24, verse 30 to 31. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. They shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So they're gathered back to earth, to stand before the Lord, to receive the rewards that were coming to them for the things they did in this life. Now the scripture tells us 
that God has prepared all things for all situations, all occasions. So no matter what we do or what we don't do, God is going to act accordingly. We have this golden opportunity to walk the path God has ordained for us to walk and receive the fullness of all that God has <clears throat> waiting for us. Turn to Ephesians, the first chapter. Ephesians, the first chapter. Verses 2 to 3. Ephesians, the first chapter, verses 2 to 3. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. What's being said here is every heaven that God ever created is an inheritance for that son that qualifies because in every heaven there are blessings waiting for him. So it goes beyond the region that you will go to when you pass this life in your glorified state, you'll have access to all the heavens, all things that God has brought forth become part of your inheritance. To <coughs> Depends on, God has made it all available to us. Turn, we're going to close, turn to Revelation 21st chapter, verse 7. God has made it all available to us, so what we do with it Basically, it's up to us. Revelation 21, verse 7. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. This is the Father's plan. All he wants to do is to give us what he's made available and spend eternity pouring out his love on that son that's been obedient to him. So in essence, it becomes a win-win situation. It starts with pursuing the word of God, <coughs> understanding what's coming to you, what your inheritance is, what's been promised to you, and then acting accordingly.